two, one. Now, before I start this video, I just want to make a personal disclaimer that classical music doesn't have a definitive answer to anything, but there are still certain boundaries that we need to stay within. So any advice that I give is not necessarily going to be a fixed solution to your technical problems, but it certainly helped me my whole life. It's helped my students I've taught for the past seven years and my teachers when they were younger as well. So you don't have to agree with everything I'd say, but just know that every advice I give is genuinely what I would tell my younger self. In this video, I want to cover two concepts that are, I think, the most fundamentals of playing the piano, which are scales and rhythm. And I want to cover the different techniques in concepts rather than literal exercises. So although I might give you certain specific exercises to do with your fingers, try and take them not too literally and think about the concepts behind them. You've probably clicked on this video because you've reached a point in your practice where you're not seeing any improvement anymore. That's exactly why I want to make this video because I've gone through the same thing as well and I'll tell you precisely how to fix that. And the first thing I want to talk about is simplicity. Later when I cover scales and rhythm as well, I'm going to try and break them down to as simple as possible because I really believe playing the piano should not be too complicated especially when you're first approaching a new concept. Yes, of course, playing the piano is technically hard, but the concepts and the understanding that you have in your head should not be too complicated. Think about the best pianists in the world that you've seen play or you've seen videos of them playing. They take the most technical difficult passages and make it seem like it's really effortless, right? So in the past, if you've come across a concept and it was too difficult for you, you're probably not understanding it correctly. Simple to understand, hard to execute. That's what piano playing should be. <laughs> One other thing I briefly want to talk about is how to practice properly. Because without this, this video is probably going to be useless to you. And the most important thing I personally found was people's natural tendencies to do mindless practice. So I think it's a natural human response to start autopiloting once you start practicing. And it should be the complete opposite. Practicing something a thousand times without thinking versus practicing something 10 times really, really conscious of what you're playing and how you're playing it. The conscious practice is going to be so much more effective. All your teachers already taught you in the past, but you just chose not to listen to them. And do you hear yourself going like, oh, I don't want to practice like that, right? Well, that's exactly why you're not improving. To put it simply, don't be lazy. To start off with scales, I truly believe that if you know how to play the scales properly and cover the concepts of scales properly, then you'll most likely be able to play most pieces that you desire to play. Now, the first concept, how do you play notes on the piano? And surprisingly, not a lot of people know this. The way I teach my students is always the same. The default position of the hand must be that the fingers are relaxed and the wrists are relaxed but they are all touching the surface of the keys. And the movement the finger does is only one. It only touches the notes and then just goes down. That's the only movement you should be doing with your fingers. And you're gonna ask me, how do I play short or how do I play long or loud or soft? That just depends on how fast your finger goes down from the notes. I'll show you. If you go down slowly, you're gonna play soft. If you go down fast, you're going to play loud. And the reason why I want to teach people how to play the scales properly is because most people's technically related problems comes from the fact that they have really underdeveloped fingers. And that's because this is a controversial way of talking. If you compare practicing to lifting weights at the gym, your muscles when lifting weights aren't going to grow as much if you don't lift as much heavy weights. Same thing for piano. For beginners, it's very important that the fingers develop the correct muscle strength or the finger strength to be able to support the weight of your hands and to be able to make a good sound. But the problem with practicing the piano is that you can't physically lift heavy weights to develop finger strength unless you're conscious about how you're playing them. So the difference is like this. If you play scales a thousand times but without thinking, autopiloting and being lazy with your fingers, just like this, you 
are never going to improve. Now, let me put everything together. So the correct finger movement of touching the note before you play, being conscious of how you play the notes, having a powerful tone, uh, a strong tone, sorry, and what it sounds like to play with strong fingers. Now the key here is to make every single note and the sound of the notes very very consistent. So just because you're playing with the thumb doesn't mean the note is too heavy, just because you're playing with the pinky doesn't mean it's too light. In other words, your fourth and fifth fingers have to be much heavier or much stronger than you usually play with. And you're going to ask me, isn't that just going to make your hand more tense? And isn't that going to make you clunky when you try and play fast? Well, remember the disclaimer I said in the beginning of this video. Classical music, especially the piano, doesn't necessarily have one definitive answer. You have to try and find the middle ground of having strong fingers versus having good phrasing or a good shape. So, clunky finger sounds like this. Having weak fingers sounds like this. Be smart and find the middle ground. On the topic of developing good fingers, I have two exercises for you, legato and staccato. Essentially, just for this exercise, I want you to think of legato as being heavy, having a strong sound, which means pushing or feeling the bottom of the note with every single note you play, even with your pinky but without using your wrist movements. So without going like this, but rather using just your finger. And I kind of relate this to making your fingers lift weights because you're actively making your fingers push more pressure down than it's used to. So it sounds something like this. Not only do you develop finger strength, but you start developing hand-eye coordination or finger-eye coordination as well. So very, very clear and even notes and even sound and even rhythm when you play. Another way of approaching this is to play staccato. And this is very important because it relates back to how you play the note properly. A lot of people think playing staccato is just doing this. Well, that's wrong because my arm did the staccato movement rather than my fingers. So the way I approach this, keep your fingers touching at all times, touching the surface. You don't move your wrist, but rather you take your fingers off as fast as, as possible. This is very different to doing this. To develop good staccato, you don't relax your fingers. You actually put a little bit more pressure towards the tip of your fingers, so you're doing a small flick. But remember, the flick always starts on the notes rather than off and then down. That's hitting. Touch, flick. Just by practicing simple scales like this, you're going to feel a massive improvement in your fingers. And remember, it's not what you play, but how you play them. Sometimes I hear people saying, oh, you shouldn't do churny exercises because churny is useless for the fingers. But that just doesn't make sense to me because whatever you play, if you know how to practice them properly and if you know how to practice consciously, then you're going to develop good fingers no matter what. And just to prove the haters wrong, I'm going to practice with preliminary piece. For those of you who aren't Australian or New Zealanders, this is the easiest book in the Australian examination syllabus. The best piece to practice staccatos on. Creepy crawlies. <laughs>
Now, because I can't spend the next 30 minutes actually practicing, I'm going to play it through, but try my best to be as conscious as possible about every finger I play and every single musical detail that's written on here. And remember, always practice slow. Just quickly, what do you think the ratio of practicing slow versus fast is? Like one to one? You practice slow once first and then you practice fast? Or maybe you should practice twice slow and then practice once fast? Slow, you practice nine times slowly and then you practice only once fast. Do you understand? <laughs> Another reason why a lot of piano students don't improve is because of their rhythm. Now, I was not that good at rhythm, but I was... <laughs> I was gonna say I didn't have good rhythm when I was younger either. That's why I relate to a lot of people who are struggling in piano. And rhythm is actually a lot more important than you think. Because it's one of the only things in some pieces that gives us structure. If I played this, could you recognize the melody? Probably not, but if I play with very, very accurate rhythm, it'll sound something like... Sounds a lot better, right? So having correct rhythm is super, super important, but I found that most students who have trouble with playing the correct rhythm, it actually comes from not being able to read the music correctly. Now, there's going to be a lot of people who hate reading the score, and I agree, I don't really like reading the score as well, but that's the only source we have to get correct information. I'm going to go through a few concepts on being able to read the note correctly with Mozart's C major sonata, the really famous one, KB 545. <laughs> With the previously mentioned conscious practice in mind, the next thing that you have to work on when practicing is hands separate. I don't care what level you are, I don't care if you self-claim that you can play piano better than me, I don't care if you're a beginner, I don't care if you're Martha Argerich, you have to practice separate hands. And if you were Martha Argerich, I wouldn't have to tell you that because she would already know that. And contrary to popular belief, practicing separate hands and practicing slowly doesn't actually need to be boring. If you're worried about playing the correct notes, having good finger strength, having good rhythm, note length, articulation, dynamics, phrasing, there are so many different things you, your mind should be focusing on that you shouldn't be, you actually can't be autopiloting and it shouldn't sound boring either. If you find yourself practicing separate hands and it's getting too boring, try to be as expressive with each hand as possible. If you're finding yourself getting too bored when practicing separate hands, try and play or perform as expressive as you can with just that one hand. And I'll show you with the left hand part of this sonata. <laughs> Kind of understand what I'm trying to say. Try and listen to how tight the rhythm should be, especially in a piece like Mozart's Sonata, and I'm going to be playing the right hand.
guarantee you for most people that are watching, you have to practice with the metronome. And actually professional musicians practice with the metronome more than you because they're actually practicing more. Let me show you a better example of this. When we get to bar 18, it's so important that the right hand is in time. Because as you can see, the right hand has semi-quavers, except it's not playing on the first beat. Which means in your head, you're subdividing in 1, 2, 3, 4, da, 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 Now once you put hands together, it'll sound something like this. Just before I forget, let me just say something about mindful practice as well. Mindful practice includes reading the score properly. So read properly, think properly. And just closing off, I want to briefly talk about getting a teacher. A lot of people on the internet ask if piano can be self-taught. And I would say yes, but it's unlike guitar, like contemporary or rock guitar I'm obviously talking about, not jazz or classical. Where you can self-teach piano to yourself, but you will have no idea of the basic fundamentals. And if you remember about the inverted pyramid I talked about, if you don't have the fundamentals, everything you learn is eventually going to crash down and you're going to be stuck at a point. So basically, self-teaching yourself without a professional teacher is only going to be limiting as time goes on. You might want to disagree with me, but jazz piano and classical piano, at the very least, is not really self-teachable. Then the question is, how do you find a good teacher? And luckily for myself, I've had probably close to 10 teachers throughout my life up to the point where I started studying the piano at university. And this is not a good thing. But luckily, I have that experience to say that no matter what people say, yes, being able to play the piano and teaching the piano is a completely different skill. But if you find a teacher that has a performance background, they are going to have a lot more knowledge than your common local piano teacher. So of course, the biggest factor here is money. But if you're serious about learning the piano, number one advice is get a teacher. And the second advice is get a teacher that at least studied a little bit in university. Also, the same thing applies for teachers where having the knowledge in your head is a completely different thing than to be able to execute it through your fingers. And lastly, stay with one teacher as long as possible because if you keep switching around different teachers, it's only going to end up confusing you. I really hope that this was a useful video. Now that you know this information, try and go apply it to your practice. If you have any questions, just comment down below and I'll try and answer them as much as I can. If you think this video was helpful, please consider subscribing. It's going to help this channel a lot and it's going to also help me a lot. Thank you for watching. Now go to practice. Thank you.